ultimately that's where the big liquidity comes in. Hi everybody, this is Value Tokenized Real Estate Special Edition. And there is no better person to speak about that than Henry Elder. As a director of origination and investment in Slice, Henry was the first one to tokenize commercial real estate in the United States. Also, Henry is a president of IPRI, International Blockchain Real Estate Association, and he's super active in education and community building in this field. Hi, Henry. We're really excited to welcome you with us today at Value Tokenize. Thank you very much Thank for you joining with us. And you have very impressive backgrounds. So you have arranged and underwritten over one billion of investments across technology and real estate field. And can you tell us a little bit about how you joined blockchain space? Yeah, actually, my first exposure to the blockchain was through my fiance, who was working uh, at a company here in LA called Gem. And Gem was building enterprise blockchain applications. Uh, and they had huge clients like Toyota and Philips. Uh, and so I kept hearing about blockchain and hearing about Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> and it coincided with this time in my life where I was working in real estate. Um, my family's actually been in real estate for four generations. And so I was the fourth generation of my family to go into real estate. And wow. I'm working at a private equity firm, right? And uh, I have this whole team that, that I'm that you know is, is working for me to support what I'm doing and I'm helping to support what they're doing. And everything that we're doing is like very manual, right? It's very like pick up the phone, verify, like you know, analyze this, underwrite that. Uh, and I realized that the processes that we used to uh, run these real estate transactions were almost exactly the same as the processes that my great grandfather used to run real estate transactions a hundred <laughs> years ago. It, it, there was almost no difference. The only difference is that we were doing it on computers, but we weren't really using the full power of the computer to run these transactions. And so it occurred to me that this industry was ripe for disruption and change. And that change was not going to happen uh, I was not going to be able to contribute to that change unless I got out from behind my desk and went and became a part of the conversation uh, and, and tried to do that myself. And blockchain seemed like, and still seems like, uh, one of the best ways to catalyze that change. And um, there is one argument that it sometimes can be heard when talking about real estate that uh, for example, fractional ownership was already existed before blockchain uh, in form of uh, funds like rates. Um, so how it was um, and is uh, performing right now and how blockchain changes that? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, fractional investing in real estate, there's really two ways for you to do it, right? One is you can go the crowdfunding route, uh, and the other is that you can go to a REIT. And each one is good for different reasons and bad for different reasons. Uh, with a REIT, a REIT is a very macroeconomic vehicle. You buy into a REIT because you want exposure to real estate as a macro asset, right? Uh, and with that, you know, there's basically very little minimum to enter, enter. It's very liquid, but you really just get exposure to real estate, not necessarily an individual building. And then with crowdfunding, you can go buy a fractional investment in an individual building and get that, that uh, granular exposure. But it's not liquid. There's nowhere for you to cash that out. I mean, you're basically locked in for the term of the deal, if not longer, if you're investing into there are certain like uh, uh, e-reads. From my perspective, at least, is that an individual who is putting aside, let's say, $100 a week or $100 a month, to go invest into crowdfunded real estate deals, well, life is unpredictable. And those people need to be able to pull their capital out when you know, their kid breaks a bone or uh, the car breaks down or you know, whatever. And so uh, on the crowdfunding side, the individuals who are investing in that are typically not your high net worth individuals, right? They're middle class uh, and they, are, uh, they don't have a ton of savings. 
And so when they need to pull those savings out, they need to be able to pull them out. They can't have it locked in this illiquid asset for God knows how long. And what blockchain does with, with tokenization is it brings those two things together. Because now you can have asset-focused investing on a fractional basis with liquidity. With the REITs, you don't have the asset focus. With the crowdfunding, you don't have the liquidity. And speaking about liquidity, what is needed to actually have this liquidity for tokenized real estate? Because right now it's one of the main arguments that right now this liquidity that security tokenization promises, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist yet. So what do we need to actually get there? This is the problem that we faced with Slice last year. Uh, we took this $380 million project and we tokenized $5 million of it. And at the time, the investment thesis was that Crypto investors were going to come flooding in because they were sick of volatility. And real estate investors were going to come flooding in because this created liquidity. But the problem we found on both sides was that there was no education. The crypto investors didn't really understand the value of diversification. And the real estate investors just did not get blockchain at all. What are these tokens? Why do I need them? And we were like, don't worry about it. Like, it's going to have liquidity. And they were like, why is it going to have liquidity? And we we're like, because it's on the blockchain. And like, so what's the blockchain, you know? Um, and blockchain at the time was still very much associated with ICOs and, you know, the, the dirtier, darker days of Bitcoin and, you know, all of those really kind of negative connotations that, you know, I don't believe and anybody else who works in this space, you know, knows that. A lot of it's not true, right? But uh, for a real estate person who they've been doing business the same way for a hundred years, and you come to them, you say, "Hey, I'm going to shake it up and I'm going to do it this new, cool way, and check out, you know, it's this technology that's hot and hip." And then they type in blockchain, and it's like ICO fraud, you know, like Bitcoin money laundering. Um, and that's why, you know, when I saw that that you guys were doing uh, this series. I was like, I, 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 I want to be on it so badly because you are both, I mean, you're both famous, right? It's an honor to be on here and you have an incredible reach uh, and platform. And so um, what I've been focused on for pretty much the last little over six months is talking to everybody that I can, getting on every stage that I can and just explaining, you know, what tokenization is and what the benefit of it is. And not only on the crypto side, but also a lot on the real estate side, because ultimately that's where the big liquidity comes in, is you get a big REIT like Prologis or Essex or Equity Office Properties. You know, these are some of the biggest REITs in the United States. You get one of them to buy into this concept and say, hey, you know what? I will tokenize a small portion of my assets just to test it out, right? And once a big REIT does that, somebody with $15, $20 billion of assets under management, then it creates this perception in the minds of investors that this is now a safe thing to do. Because somebody with that kind of liability, that kind of a fiduciary responsibility, $20 billion, they're not going to tokenize something unless it's 100% safe, right? What is the difference between tokenization of commercial real estate and of residential real estate? Yeah, so uh, in effect, the, the tokenization of both assets, you do it the same way right now. Uh, you take a something called a single purpose entity, which is a company that exists only to own the real estate. And so that company is the one that actually, the name of that company is on the deed to the real estate. And then when you're tokenizing something, what you're doing is you're taking the ownership of that company and you're selling the shares uh, as tokens. <clears throat> so when people talk about tokenizing nowadays, that's basically what, that's what they mean. Um, so when you're doing, uh, one thing that, that people are trying to do right now that would change the meaning of tokenization is tokenizing the deed itself. And if you could tokenize the deed itself, if you could have that deed represented by a token that lives on the blockchain, and then also eventually turn title registry, you know, the title registries on the blockchain, 
uh, then you would be able to uh, have direct ownership. And you know, people talk about, and, and this is you know a, a, an interesting point because everybody talks about fractional ownership, right? That the blockchain will bring fractional ownership, the crowdfunding brings fractional ownership, but it's not true ownership, it's fractional investment. You're an investor in the deal. If you're an actual owner of the real estate, then in the United States, you can do something called a like-kind exchange or a 1031. And a 1031 means that you can buy a real estate property. You can buy it for $100, right? And then you sell, this is just an example. You buy it for $100, you sell it for $120 uh, 10 years later. You can take that $20, and as long as you roll all $120 into another property within a certain amount of time, that $20 of profit, you don't have to pay taxes on. You can only do that, however, if you are the actual owner of the property. You can't do it if you're an, just an investor, if you are basically investing into it through another entity and you're, and you're like an LP. Uh, and so with the 1031, I mean, that $20 million, uh, that $20, you don't have to pay the taxes on it until you sell the new property. But if you sell the new property and you roll the money, 1031 it into another new property, Again, all of the tax liability is basically pushed off. And you can keep doing this until the day you die. And then all of that liability literally gets forgiven and the properties are handed to your children at a stepped up basis or your, your heirs. And so it's like, it's this crazy trick that every real estate investor in the, you know, in the United States is taking advantage of you know, at least once in their investing career and all of the, you know, super wealthy real estate families use to protect their generational wealth. But people who are investing in REITs and people who are investing in crowdfunded deals and people who are investing in tokenization right now can't take advantage of it. And the reason is because, and from the tokenization side, the reason is because the deeds themselves are not tokenized yet. And so if we can start putting deeds and, and, and title registries on the blockchain, then you can create true tokenization of the entire ownership of the property. And then you can start fractionalizing that in interesting ways. And then those fractional owners can start taking advantage uh, of 1031 tax exemptions or tax deferrals, they really are. And I'm not, I'm not just, just as a disclaimer, I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not an accountant. So definitely we'll talk to you. We'll do ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so it is happening already. Is what projects maybe you can um, advise to you to look at to follow who are doing this? Yeah, so one of them is Proppy. Uh, Proppy's working on that. Proppy is uh, was one of the first uh, real estate focused blockchain companies to do an ICO. They had a very successful ICO in 2017, uh, and I actually just talked to the CEO Natalia uh, last week, and they are running a couple. Uh, real estate, uh, it's residential title on the blockchain pilots with a few different counties in Vermont state here in the US. And then there was another company called Velox.re that was uh, founded by Ragnar Lathracer, who is also the founder of the International Blockchain Real Estate Association. Uh, and they did a pilot project in Cook County, Illinois with the recorder's office there. And that was back in 2015, I want to say, 2015 or 2016. So there are some people that are, that are working hard uh, to do this. What are the main legal obstacles to um, do that on a wider scale? That's a good question. Uh, and I'm not sure that I'm necessarily the best qualified to answer it. I can tell you from uh, just overall adoption, not necessarily just legal issues. Uh, title is maintained in this sort of public-private partnership, right? There are uh, registrar's offices in every county in the United States. And those registrar's offices maintain a huge paper database of all of the real estate uh, titles in that county. And that's the public side of it. On the private side, you have title insurance companies. And those title insurance companies maintain 
their own internal databases of all of the title registries. Uh, and what they do is they sell you insurance against the fact that their own internal registry might be wrong. Um, and so you have to get both sides of that equation to adopt these uh, blockchain solutions. And on the public side, there's a lot of bureaucracy. On the private side, uh, it might threaten their business model a little bit. So there's a little bit of, of, of uh, you know, a slower uptake there as well. However, uh, First American Title Company is also running an internal blockchain pilot now uh, too. And they're one of the big, I think, so there are basically four uh, big title companies in the United States, uh, and they're one of those four. So that's that's actually really encouraging. And can you tell us what Slice is currently up to and what are you working on mostly right now? Yeah, so Slice, you know, we did that big deal last year. Uh, it was really exciting and we learned a lot. What we realized at the time was that it was a little bit too early to start trying to commercialize that process. That so much of the... Uh, of the fight that was left to make this a reality remained on the educational side, which is why I started focusing so much on that. And, you know, talking to you guys and talking at conferences and talking to big REITs and talking to big buy side advisory firms and talking to appraisal firms and brokerages uh, and all that stuff. And so, you know, Slice still exists. Um, we're sort of biding our time right now. Uh, Pushing forward, you know, this, this message of education, honestly, anybody who wants to learn about tokenization or talk more about it, I always encourage them to reach out to me because I'm always super happy to talk about it. Um, but we're not, we're not really uh, pushing more deals through the Slice Pipeline right now. You're a president of IBREA, uh, International Blockchain Real Estate Association. Uh, can you tell us more about the initiative? Yeah, yeah. So Ragnar was the founder of that. Uh, I joined it a couple years ago uh, and recently became the president of Ibrea, the International Blockchain Real Estate Association. Um, and Ibrea is a really cool organization. It's a nonprofit. It's 100% grassroots. Uh, it has, it's been around since 2013, and it focuses on all different kinds of real estate and blockchain uh, use cases, not just tokenization, which is you know obviously my specialty, but title, uh, you know the construction process. Um, it, there, there are data. I mean, there are so many different use cases for blockchain technology in real estate. And what Ibrea seeks to be is a home for all of those different uh, real estate blockchain entrepreneurs. So Ibrea, um, it interfaces and works with regulators and stakeholders and uh, entrepreneurs and investors uh, in real estate all over the world. And so what we try to do is we're just like a, uh, a big open source community where anybody can come in and ask a question and find the right person who can answer that question uh, within Ibrea. And I mean, like, our, the reach of this organization is incredible. Since getting involved, I mean, it's like, um, I've spoken with, you know, so there was a, a bill that was uh, proposed in the United States Congress called the Token Taxonomy Act. And I've been able to speak with some of the people who helped write that bill, uh, just because, you know, it's, it's just so, there are over 6,000 members of Ibrea worldwide, and it's been pushing uh, and promoting real blockchain and real estate for so long that people have such an incredible respect for it that it's it's like if you come to them and you say, hey, you know, I'm coming on behalf of my brand, I want to learn more about this or help you do this, you know, it just opens doors. It's really incredible. Uh, can you maybe share some of your favorite cases for blockchain and real estate except for tokenization? Um, so other than the, the title stuff that's going on, I, I, we talked a little bit about the title pilots. Um, I mean, putting the blockchain, putting real estate ownership on the blockchain, I think, is one of the most important use cases uh, because at its core, right, and, and we all know this, the blockchain provides this immutable uh, source of truth, right? And it's open to all and it's, it, it cannot be... Uh, 
uh, corrupted in, in, in any manner. And so ownership of land has throughout history been one of the most important uh, parts of any citizen's life, right? There was a time when only people who owned land could vote, right? It's, it's, it's always been strongly linked with an individual's uh, ability to survive and thrive. And governments understand that, which is one of the reasons that pretty much the ultimate arbiter of truth for ownership is always controlled by the government and therefore can be corrupted by the government. And we've seen that many times in the past. We've seen it in South Africa and Zimbabwe and India and pretty much anywhere that, was, that, that has been colonialized, both during colonialization and after after the, the colonial period. Uh, and disenfranchising someone of their land, someplace that they have, you know, that, 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 that they have raised their families and toiled and sweated and bled to, uh, to build and, and to create, taking that away from them just because the government can at any time is not really a power that governments should have. And we've seen it abused so many times. And putting that on the blockchain can help to maintain that immutable record of truth for the landowner, but remove some of the danger of it being abused by a government. And so I think that that is probably even more so than tokenization, the most important use case for blockchain and real estate. Um, but Moving on from that, which I know is kind of a heavy topic, there are a ton of other really interesting use cases, right? I mean, there's construction, constructing a building uh, in, in anywhere. It, it, the construction process is incredibly complex, uh, and there are a whole bunch of different third parties, uh, and there's not a lot of really good technology out there to help tie all of those third parties together uh, and, and uh, create an efficient uh, supply chain for that construction. And we've already seen blockchain used in a whole bunch of supply chain uh, use cases, right? For like meat and for shipping and for uh, uh, manufacturing. And so taking that same uh, technology that's been applied to that and applying it to the supply chain for construction could, could, could create efficiencies in the construction process. Um, and then I think that the last important one, uh, and I'm sure that there are other important ones, but the, the last one that comes to mind is uh, data. Because in order for something to be, uh, in order for a security to be fluidly traded, to have a lot of liquidity, you need data about the underlying asset. Uh, and so creating these decentralized, very easily accessible data repositories that allow you to see the performance of the asset that underlies the token that you're buying, you need that. Otherwise, why would you buy the token, right? You're, you're not going to buy it unless you have more data. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there right now. And this already exists in the current conventional real estate markets. Uh, but that is a function of the fact that real estate is a totally manual process right now anyways. So there hasn't been a lot of impetus to change that. Um, but if we want to move to a less manual, more automated, more liquid investing environment, we're going to need to bring the data out of the darkness as well. I have a question about uh, governments. Uh, and so um, do you think there might be some obstacles from bigger uh, institutions, maybe some governmental institutions against tokenization and against um, um, keeping everything on blockchain because uh, right now they have some kind of ability to manipulate and to um, like keep not control. everybody benefits from transparency. So. Yes, and keep control of like price discovery, for example. Do you think that might be a big obstacle? Uh, absolutely, a hundred percent. And price discovery is a, a really interesting one, actually. Um, because something that real estate has benefited from, especially the, the, the large investors who make up so much of the real estate market, 
uh, they have benefited from the lack of price discovery in real estate uh, for a long time. Because, you know, let's take 2008, 2009 as an example. When the markets melted down, the public markets, if you were holding an IRA or a 401k or any sort of stocks, you knew every single day how much money that stock had lost, right? Uh, and that's very painful to see. Uh, but real estate investors, they don't have that kind of a mark to market. They don't have that kind of instant price discovery. And so a real estate guy can go to the bank and say, hey, I need a loan. You know, my real estate is worth $100 million. And it's difficult for the bank to say otherwise because it doesn't have the same kind of fluid price discovery. Whereas if they own a whole bunch of Apple stock and they say, hey, I'm worth $100 million, the bank is like, no, sorry, Apple stock's not trading at that anymore. You're worth $50 million, you know? And then they'll probably still give them a loan, but uh, it's it's still uh, it's easier for real estate people to to ride ride the the, the turbulence a little bit better. So I realize I don't know if I quite answered your question. There could be some uh, there could be some some pushback uh, on that side, and I've heard I've heard it mentioned before. I'm not super worried about it uh, because. The march of history is in, inexorably in the direction of progress. Uh, markets do become more efficient. Uh, investors and market participants do always move towards uh, the more efficient, more liquid, uh, more useful uh, paradigm. And so I think that one way or another, real estate is going to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, into this market because there are too many other people who see benefit from it and they will capitalize on that benefit and eventually uh, everybody else will be forced to come along. Um, but it, it will it'll, it'll probably slow us down a little bit in the meantime, yeah. And I think one last question to wrap it up for today. Uh, can you give us some prediction about what you see coming for this sector for real estate and tokenization of real estate in 2018? So what we should expect here? Yeah, so uh, I think that we will see more tokenization in other parts of the world uh, is one of the first things. Australia, uh, South Africa, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Germany, England. These are all places where I've talked to uh, entrepreneurs and real estate owners who want to tokenize their properties. Uh, and I think that the United States has laid a good groundwork for how this can be done uh, and started educating investors on it. And so I want to see more uh, international jurisdictions uh, follow that playbook and, and bring more good product to the market. The other side of that is uh, moving from, you know, relatively small single asset tokenizations to much larger portfolios and much larger deals. Uh, and we've seen two big deals get announced within the last uh, 30 days. One is Elevated Returns, and they're the guys who did the St. Regis deal. They are partnering with Securitize and building a solution on uh, the Tezos blockchain, and they're planning to tokenize a billion dollars of their portfolio, which is pretty awesome. Because uh, I've spoken with the Elevated Returns guys many, many times, uh, and they are incredibly committed to uh, this future. And I, I think that that is fantastic. Uh, and then the other one is Invenium Capital. Uh, I actually just spoke with, with their founder uh, yesterday and they are tokenizing $260 million of uh, real estate assets also all over the US uh, in a deal that's going live like within the next 30 days. And uh, it's a really interesting mix of assets. They're using a slightly different uh, structure than what's been done in the past, which I think is really exciting. Um, and they're also using some different, uh, some different third parties uh, that I've been really excited to see enter this space, which is Invenium themselves, uh, really interesting company and very dedicated to this, but also uh, Dave Hendricks at, at Vertalo and uh, the whole team at Securency uh, are also working on that deal. 
And uh, I think you guys have spoken with, with Dave. And then uh, other than that, you know, there's just some very interesting service providers entering uh, from different parts of the field. Uh, there's a company called uh, Tokenomics that wants to build some of the back office stuff for uh, real estate tokenization because there's so much stuff that you need with the data and with the trading and all this stuff to make these more liquid. Uh, and then, you know, Propeller, which just became Fluidity Factora, they're doing huge stuff out of New York. Um, yeah, there's just, there's a ton, a ton of momentum in this industry right now. Probably one more question. Um, you mentioned many countries uh, where you see interest um, from the set of companies who want to, or maybe like the yeah, companies who want to recognize real estate, but which market is most ready, except for US, from the set of investors? That's a good question. Um, I forgot to mention one country that I've spoken with people, and that's Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, I should have mentioned that, right? And I have actually some of the first people that I talked to who were interesting in tokenizing, interested in tokenizing property were were uh, were in Russia. Um, but in terms of investors who are most interested outside of the U.S., uh, I see quite a few, and I talked to quite a few in Israel, uh, and then Hong Kong, Japan, and uh, South Korea and Singapore. Uh, I get a lot of interest from uh, investors there. So it seems like there's a strong core of interested investors in Israel and the Middle East and then in uh, Eastern Asia. Thank you very much for joining us. It was very interesting and very comprehensive. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, and great meeting you both.